All right, ready for your hackneyed, cliched, trite moment of philosophy. You knew it was coming. You've been waiting for it. All right, the question is this. If a tree falls in the woods and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? What would Locke and Barclay say? Would this tree falling down have made a sound even if no one was around to hear it? And I'm going to suggest to you that they would both say no. The tree falling did not make a sound. Um, they're going to argue that sound, like taste, like texture, like odor, is a sensation that exists in us, not external to us. So as I've suggested to you, sourness doesn't exist in the lemon. Sourness is a sensation that's produced in me when my taste buds engage with the lemon. But there's no sourness in the lemon. And Barclay and Locke are going to say the same thing about this falling tree. If there were no ears around that could have engaged with those mechanical waves that the tree falling created, then there was nothing to, to, to convert those um, mechanical waves into the sensation of sound. So if there were no squirrels, no deer, no people, no dogs around, nothing with ears around, then no sound existed. The mechanical waves did. Maybe the mechanical waves caused other trees to even fall down. But again, if there's no ears to engage with those mechanical waves, then there's nothing that can produce the same sen the, the sensation of sound. Now, Barclay's going to take this to, uh, <laughs> he said it's wild. Barclay's going uh, to push forward here a little bit. And he's going to look at Locke and he's going to say, hey, Locke, I know that you operate off this assumption that there are things that exist in physical reality um, like trees and rocks and people, and they exist independently of us and our sensations. And you even say that you know these things exist in physical reality because they have properties or qualities that uh, exist independently of us. They don't depend on us um, experiencing these things in order for these properties to exist. Things like size, shape, location. You're saying, Locke, those things exist in those objects independently of us. And then when we engage these things with our sense organs, they have these secondary qualities that are um, able to produce, uh, th that are sensations that we experience. These things that exist as objects in reality have the ability to produce sensations like color uh, or sound or odor in us. But I'm going to remind you, Locke, that I told you you're wrong. You're wrong in assuming that there are qualities that exist independently of us in these physical objects in physical reality because, as I've shown you, the only way you can access things like size and shape and position is by first experiencing a sensation, by first experiencing something like color. You can only identify the shape of the lemon and where it is if it has color. You can only verify that it's there by touching it if it has texture. So you've kind of got it backwards, Locke, is what Berkeley, Berkeley is saying. He's saying what's primary are the sensations that we experience in response to uh, an engagement with reality. And it's at that point that we can interpret the sensation that we're having to identify things like position and shape and size. Okay, And so Berkeley's going to say that what this suggests is that if you don't have a sensation of a thing, like a fallen tree and the sound it makes, or the lemon and its color, if you don't have some sort of sensation associated with this, this event in reality, then you don't have any rationale for believing that a physical reality exists independently of us. The only thing you can really say for certain is that we have perceptions, but you can't say for sure what these perceptions are of. You only know that we have them. And then we interpret those perceptions to draw conclusions about what the nature of things are like. But really, the only thing we can know are our sensations, are our perceptions. So things, Barclay says, stuff, insofar as it's actually stuff and it actually exists, they exist as sense data or as interpretations of sense data. In other words, the things that Locke is saying exist in physical reality, we can't know we don't have any reason for believing they actually exist. The only thing we have reason for believing, the only thing we have reason to believe exists are our sensations, are our perceptions. And this leads Barclay to this profound conclusion. SAS percipi, to be is to be perceived. In other words, for Barclay, the only thing you can be sure about is that the things that exist are your perceptions. Beyond that, you can't know much of anything. You come into the world 
as a little baby, and you come in and you are bombarded by all kinds of stimuli, sense data, okay? Sounds and textures and odors and sights and colors, all kinds of phenomenon. And you, as this little baby, start to interpret all of this sense data coming at you, and, and, and you have perceptions of what this sense data is. And it's those, you, those perceptions that end up becoming sort of your worldview. It's how you think of reality and what's in it. But it all begins with you having perceptions, Barclay says. And that's the only thing that actually uh, we can say exists, that we can actually say exists with any justification. All right, so let's see where this takes Barclay in terms of what reality is like and how we can acquire knowledge of it.